so we left him, as you recall or not, okay, with having made a promise to do Meister. We spoke through the laws of charity. We spoke through the idea of what the number 10 signifies. We spoke about what, we didn't speak about what making a vow to God achieves. So we're going to start with that, and then we're going to talk about how he, what happened to him in Lavan's house. We spoke about his being faithful to Lavan, although Lavan was a crook. So we have to go through all of the laws concerning employee-employer relationships. So first, the idea of what does making a vow do? So when a person is in, this, in, this, in a life situation, any life situation, the rule is a human acts and God responds. So the beginning is always with the deeds of the human. Okay, so the way this is stated in Kabbalah is that there's an awakening below before there could be an awakening from above. So Hashem is like a shadow, so to speak. It says in Tehillim, I'm the shadow of your right hand, meaning the hand moves and then you see the shadow. So everything that Hashem does in response to you or to people as a whole or to the world in general has to do with the ability of you, other people, or the world in general to receive what he wants to give. So in that sense, if you need challenge, what you'll get is challenge. If what you need is ease, what you'll get is ease. Everything fits your specific destiny, the way a glove fits a hand. So what that means is if you change, what you receive changes. Everything depends ultimately on you, which doesn't mean if you're good, you'll have good things happen because challenge is part of the package and often the best part of the package. So with that in mind, let's say a person is in this kind of horrific scenario, skip everything that led to it, but you're in the waiting room of the emergency area where surgeries are taking place and your only child who you waited 15 years is in the emergency surgery room. Okay, you're, you're there? So you don't know what's going to happen. Look at all of the different things that are factors in this scenario. Your child is an actor in the play, but so are you, so is your husband, right? So are all the people who the child knows. So is the world as a whole. All of these are players in this play. Could you see where this is so? So what's going to happen depends not only on you, but on everybody else. So the first thing I want you to understand is why one person's prayer should affect anybody beyond themselves. Okay, so you could think, well, gosh, here's your child. He's in the emergency area. Here's some other child. You'll pray for your child. Nobody's praying for this other child. Why should your child be in a better position than the other child? So the way prayer works is even though we see ourselves as completely separate from every other person, which is a reasonable way of thinking, if you think materially, as we all do, God sees us as one, the Jewish people as one collective soul. So I want to illustrate this. Um, suppose we're downstairs in the lunch area, as we will be in just a few short hours. Wow, look at that. Overcooked peas. I just, I'm counting the minutes. Okay, yeah. Okay. So, um, so let's say in my zeal to get at the peas, I spill some on you. So what's my line? I'm a nice person. What do I say if I spill peas all over your shirt? I'm so sorry. What's your line? You're a nice person. It's okay. It's okay. okay. So, and we both might even mean it. It's possible. Such things have happened. So the fact is, though, even if you're sincere when you say it's okay, your shirt is dirty and my shirt isn't, right? So that's because in the material world, the rule is separation. In the material world, the rule is separation. The more materialistic you are, the more conscious you are of the separation. Till, till a true materialist really sees themselves as divorced, so to speak, from everyone else. That makes sense to you? Okay, the more spiritual a person is, the more they feel a degree of connection to everyone else, even though materially we're separate. To the point that there are people who, when they see or hear of somebody else's suffering, they feel pain, even though they're not that person. Okay, so I, I'll give you an example of this. Remember how yet, um, two days ago there was a child who went lost, who went missing in Neve Yaakov? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay, how did people feel when they heard this? A six-year-old wandering around alone at night. Everyone was, we have to do something, right? So there were like hundreds of volunteers, helicopters from the police. Okay, got this? So this was all coming from people feeling some level of connection with the child, with his family. Okay, clear? 
So it's safe to say that the volunteers are people who have some level of spiritual capacity. Otherwise, they would say what? One more, one less. What's the difference? OK, clear? OK, so with that in mind, prayer affects everyone. It doesn't just affect you. But the response is always in, the, in relation to, to where you are. So let's say you have this scenario again. You're in the, you're the scenario I described. You're in the waiting room. And you say, God, if you do a miracle, the doctor said would take a miracle. If you do a miracle, I'll give $1,000 to charity. OK? Does God know whether you're sincere or not? Yes. OK, so it's not like when you pledge money to Israel bonds and who knows if they'll ever get it, whatever. OK, if you, so now, if you're sincere, and the sincerity here is the main feature, God views it as though you already gave the $1,000, so it's part of your existent reality because God doesn't live in time. So because of this, making a vow really does have an effect the same way doing a good deed has an effect. But the clause is if you're absolutely, if you're absolutely sincere. So do you think the rule is that it's a good thing to make vows or a bad thing? What would you say in the light of what I just said? So most of us would say, good. It changes your, your level of being. However, that's only if you're absolutely sincere and you actually fulfill your vow. Because sometimes the scenario changes as soon as the danger abates. Could you see where this is so? I may have told you this. We actually have a family friend who's conservadox, if you know what I mean. And um, so he was uh, swimming off the coast in Florida. And he swam farther than he should have. And he ended up drowning. So um, as, as he was going under, he made a vow. He said, God, if you save me somehow, I'll go to Israel. I'll study Torah. So just then, he's like, Mamash, he, said, he, he told us this. He said he was sure these were his last seconds. A boat passed, threw him a rope, and saved him. As soon as he got to shore, he, told, he added a clause. As soon as possible. What does as soon as possible mean? Like, not now. Not now. So, OK. So he said, I have to finish my degree. I'm not going to go unskilled. OK, that takes time. Now, you can't get a good job with just, you know, just like an undergraduate degree, can you? No. Uh huh. So you have to get a graduate degree. And during the time he was getting his graduate degree, well, he met, he met like Linda. And like, you know, having somebody in your life, you have to marry her, right? Like you just said, OK. So after he marries Linda, he'll go to Israel. Um, but you can't go to Israel, like, once you're married, you can't go with, like, no savings, can you? So, like, you have to have a nest egg. So years pass. By then, of course, children are born. You can't just, like, uproot children in the middle of their education. Uh, could, could you see where this is going? Mm -hmm. So one night, he had a dream, and the dream was very vivid. And he saw himself drowning again. He remembered his vow, and he said to Linda, when he got up, we're going to Israel in two weeks. And they really did. OK, clear? But a lot of people don't keep their vows, not because they're insincere when they made them, but because when the danger abates, it seems no longer real. OK, clear? So therefore, it says it's better not to make a vow than to keep a vow and not keep it. Make a vow and not keep it. So the purpose of Yaakov's vow was to bring him to another level. So the question is, why did he need to be on a higher level? What's wrong with the level he was in? Why is he stretching himself to this degree? Who needs this elastic? His vow was that if, he, if God provides him with his bare necessities, he'll give a tenth of everything he has, the miser. OK, so I want to tell you what the need was. He knew where he was going. He knew from his mother who Lavan was. He knew what kind of a household it is. He knew the kind of people he'd be encountering. OK, he knew that everyone is affected by their environment. Is this true or not? Yeah. How many of you would say, no, there are some people who are totally unaffected by their environment? Everyone is affected by their environment. And the way that Rambam states it in the Yad is everyone, not weak people or gullible people or susceptible people. Everyone is affected by environment. You all believe that that's true? I just ruined your lives. I'll tell you how. OK, once you admit that it's true that you're affected by your environment, whose responsibility is to put themselves in a good environment? Yours. So you've just lost your best excuse. Until now, you had such a great excuse. It's not my fault. It's my family. It's, my, it's the social atmosphere at a university today in America. It's the media. OK, got this? 
you're responsible, okay? So Yaakov knew this. He said, to, for me to survive spiritually in this environment, I have to stretch myself. Okay, clear? So we spoke about how he actually encountered love and right, the well, he goes home, okay. So he tells um, Lavan that when Lavan, after his month-long stay, suggests, like in a rather in lawly way, um, why not work for me since you have to work? Okay. So and Yaakov agreed to this, by the way. He had no problem with working. So what are the obligations employers have to employees? What are the obligations that employees have to employers? I want to go there right now. So. The basic responsibility for setting the terms of employment are on the employer. So the employer's responsibility is to make it extremely clear to the employee what the job is, whether he's being paid for the job or for the time it takes to do the job, which is, a, these are two different halachic frames, how much he'll be paid and when he'll be paid. So I want to bring this into the current reality. If you take a taxi, who's the employer and who's the employee? You're the employer. You're the employer. So you have to make it clear to the driver where you want to go, that you want the meter on if you want the meter on, and if you don't want the meter on, if you want a fixed rate, how much that rate will be. And you have to be ready to pay him immediately. So here are the, the traps that, I, that girls sometimes fall into. You just tell him a destination. You say, Tachana Merkazit. You get there, he says, 45 shekels, okay? Do you have to pay him that even though the, the price should be 10 shekels less or not? Yeah. Yes, because you did not set terms. So if you didn't set terms, you have to go by his terms, even if he's wrong. Okay, clear? Suppose you say, whatever the meter says, and you get caught in traffic on, on Kanfei Sharim, which any time between 4 in the afternoon and 6 in the evening is a very strong likelihood. And it ends up costing you 60 shekel. So do you have to pay him? Absolutely, unless you said, here's a set price. Is it worth it for you to do for 40? OK, clear? So you always have to pay unless you set the terms. You also can't pull that on a driver. The assumption is that all rides are paid for in cash. So if you don't have the cash, don't take the cab. Okay, don't at the end say, I'll give you a check or here's my card, unless you state it up front. Okay, got it? So that's the employer's responsibility. What's the employee's responsibility? To do the job that was described. Now remember, I said there are two kinds of employment, when you're paid by the job or paid by the hour. So if you're paid by the job, as long as you do the job, even if you don't work as many hours as the employer assumed it would take to do the job, you still should be paid exactly what was made up. So for instance, if you, um, this happens to people. You hire a repairman to fix your washing machine. He looks at it for less than five minutes. He says, can't be fixed, ma'am, okay? And could this happen? You say, so you say, why not? And says, well, the motor's gone. A new motor's going to cost you more than a new machine, you know, because this is like an old model. It has to be ordered. And, okay. So and says, okay. And you say, wow, that's bad news. Well, thank you for coming. And he says, $250 for the visit, okay? You have to pay him unless you started, so you stated otherwise to begin with, because you paid him to come and to examine your machine. Unless you said, I won't pay you unless you fix it, which believe me, he won't come if you say that. Okay, you have to pay. This is clear because you're paying by the job. You're not paying by the time. You can't say, I don't give you so much money for five minutes of your life. Okay, got it? Okay, so here are some other, uh, other things that come up. Okay, um, you're working and you're being paid by the hour, not by the job, which is the worst way to work. Always try to avoid that because the halachas here are very exacting. If you're being paid by the hour and not by the job, then you have to be extremely exacting about time. That means you have to give 60 minutes to the hour. Okay, clear? So that means you can't do personal stuff on the boss's time if he's paying you for the time and not for the work. You can't do what, you know, chat, um, coffee breaks unless they're a negotiated part of the contract. You can't do anything for yourself on the boss's time. So therefore, it's always better to be paid by the job. Okay, clear? 
There was somebody who became observant when she was already employed, which real, even in halacha, that's tricky. So she was working in a bank, and um, she told the bank manager, I'm so sorry, but I'll have to get off um, many hours before closing time on Friday, but I'm happy to make it up on any other day. So he said, no, like Friday is a busy day. No, this isn't like, no. If like, you want to be religious, that's fine, but that's on your dime. Okay, so, um, so she tried negotiating. She agreed to take you know, a cut in salary. Like she was, willing to, she was like willing to negotiate, but he wasn't. So this was in Boston. As things turn out, okay, there's um, a man in Boston who's a very big businessman, as is his father, whose business he basically runs, and his two brothers who run the business with him. So the father called up and said, could you please close all of my accounts? And the manager said, what? He says this, that's my account, my son's account, his brother's account, all of the accounts that are connected to our business. And he said, what happened? And he said, well, if you discriminate against Sabbath observance, I really don't feel comfortable. That, she got her job back so fast, <laughs> okay, clear, like, you know, within seconds she had her job back. So that does sometimes happen. I want you to know that, um, there's an organization in the United States called Agudat Yisrael. In Israel, there's a political party called Agudat Yisrael. They're not the same thing. It's the, uh, there's a lawyer who works for Agudat Yisrael whose name is Nate Le um, Lewin. He's the one who, may, who forced the Supreme Court to make Sabbath observance a right. You have no idea of how hard this stuff was before it became a right. It was like, it was extremely hard to hold a job. There were people whose like normal reality was like, you get a job on Thursday, get fired on, you know, on Friday. So um, we, we live in easy times. Okay, clear? Okay, so all that in mind, more things. Canceling a taxi. Let's say you hire, you call a taxi, and he, they don't come, and another taxi drives by. And you stop there and say, hey, he didn't come. That's his problem, not mine. And you're, because you're a decent person, you call up the company and you cancel. There are people who won't even do that, right? Is that okay or not okay? Wait, what happened? You, you called a company. You should, in general, by the way, I want to give you this as advice. Call companies. Don't just flag down cabs in the street. At least a third of the cabs are Arab. And it's not, it's not worth it for you, okay? So um, you could get the office has a list of cab companies. They're good. Use cab companies, and the, the Harnov cab companies will take you back to Harnov for 40 shach from any place in Jerusalem, which often, is your, which often is financially worth it as well. Not from Harnov, just to Harnov. So in any case, you call the company, right? They say, Sholeach, which means I'm sending, and they hang up on you. And a minute passes, two minutes, five minutes, seven minutes, 10 minutes, no taxi. But you see other taxis whizzing by on the street. So finally said, look, he didn't come, and you get into another taxi. Is that okay or not okay? I would do it. Okay, so again, who sets the terms of employment? You do, right? So what you do when you call a taxi is you always ask, when? When's he going to come? So they will always tell you either now or five minutes. That means after 10 minutes, you're free, because they broke their side of the agreement. So if you don't ask when, Okay, you have to wait a whole 15 minutes, which is not worth it for you. Okay, clear? Okay, got it? Okay, other things that come up. Okay, suppose um, you break something in the course of work. Okay, you're watching kids and they break an expensive toy while you're watching them. Um, you're cooking for somebody and uh, um, you thought that the, like that, that button on the oven was a timer, but no, it was something else. Now the whole oven is gone. Okay, clear? Do you have to pay for damages you do in the course of work? So the answer is, by and large, no, as long as you acted in good faith, if you didn't purposely, or if you didn't purposely break it or you were grossly negligent. Okay, clear? Okay, um, so that means as an employer, you hire someone, this happened to me, you hire someone to fix something, and he breaks it more. So I didn't want to pay him anything. But when I called the Rav, he said I have to pay him because I paid him for, I agreed to pay him for his time, so I have to still pay him. 
and he doesn't owe me anything for the damage because it was done in the course of normal work. Okay, clear? Got it? More things would involve if, um, if you're hired, let's say, to babysit, to be an apartment, to um, apartment sit, and things happen. So if you're being paid for this job, if it's a job, you have to pay for almost every possible kind of loss. Okay, if you're doing it as a favor, you don't have to pay for theft, you don't have to pay for loss. So there's a big difference in the actual laws. Okay, last thing. Suppose your idea of a good, of a well-done job and your employer's idea of a well-done job have nothing to do with each other. They hire you to make dinner. They have in mind a three-course gourmet fare. You made eggs. Okay, clear? So, <laughs> so who's at fault? The employer, okay, clear? Okay, they have to specify. Okay, as an employee, therefore, what you get, and by and large, the employee is in a better position than the employer, okay? There are no minimum wage laws in halacha, so therefore, you can't go back to the employer and say, but I expect it to be pay A. It's you have to see that he tells you what your wage will be. Got it? Okay, so now going back to Yaakov. So now I want to ask you a question. Suppose your employer is a crook. Do you have to be straight with him, or could it be reciprocal? Hmm? You still have to be straight with him, because otherwise you become what you hate. This is a big principle in Jewish behavior. When you get into reciprocity, you end up becoming what you hate. So if you hate someone's being a crook, and then you're crooked, if you hate someone being a liar, and then you lie, if you hate somebody being um, vengeful, and then you get back at them, you become what you hate. So you don't have to be, um, you don't have to be what somebody else is. However, you don't have to be naive. So if you know that somebody is planning to deceive you, you could protect yourself, but that's different than getting back at them or acting like them. So, for instance, suppose um, you suspect that after you do, let's say, a babysitting job, the people will say, oh, I don't have any money on me right now, I'll pay you next week, and then next week comes, and you call, hey, do you have the money ready? And they say, oh, I was just about to leave the house, so maybe call me again. You call them again, and they say, all I have is a $100 bill, do you have change? Okay, got the picture? So at that point, Okay, then after you've given them several chances, you don't have to be naive. You have to say, well, I guess I'll be at your house. I'll be staying there until you actually pay me the money, and it's really up to you until you get it, like, or whatever. Okay, clear? Okay, so you don't have to be naive, but you don't have to become what they are. So your intent is just to get what's owed you as opposed to getting back at them. But there are limits on this. So I'll tell you a true story that happened to me. Okay, I bought, when my children were small, I bought a stroller. When I got home, I saw the wheels were malaligned, okay? So I figured, okay, I'm going back to the store, I'll get them to either change it or give me my money back. But things have changed now in Israel. In Israel, you do have the right to get something exchanged or your money back within two weeks. But then it was really up to the, it was up to the seller. And I didn't, make, I didn't make any stipulations. I didn't say I expect a guarantee on this, okay? So I'm the one who owns the problem, but whatever. So they said, so sorry, you could have looked at it in the store. Um, you know, you get what you pay for, you know, that sort of thing. So I stayed in the store, and every time a customer came in, I showed them the carriage. I said, do you see that how male aligned these wheels are? This is what I bought here. They won't change it or give me my money back. You never know what you get when you buy here. It came wrapped in cellophane. I had no way of seeing it. Of course, I could have opened it in the store, but I didn't. Do you know what you're getting? How long did it take until the man gave me my money back? But yeah, he wanted me out of the store. <laughs> so, um, so I was wrong in halacha. Why? Because I was forcing him to change the agreement. Okay, you can't do things by force. You can't take the law into your own hands. So, so going back to Yaakov, so he made a decision that in spite of the fact that Lavan was a thief who tried to change his wage agreement 10 different times, always in his own favor, of course, he behaved with absolute integrity. Okay, clear? So his agreement was that he would work as a shepherd for seven years in exchange for marrying Rachel. Okay, so seven years pass, and you know, 
when you're talking about taking care of animals, there's really no time limit. You know, so if a sheep gives birth in the middle of the night, he was there in the middle of the night. If a lamb got lost, he would search over, like he was going far beyond what any contract, you know, any contract would require. So now it's the day of the wedding. Do you know the rest of the story? Yeah. Okay. So what I want to ask you is from Rachel's perspective, why was she right? If she made signs with Yaakov, this is how I'll know it's really you. And later she gave the signs to Leah. Was she right or wrong? I think she didn't have to do that. She, was she certainly didn't have to. I'm talking about it. the fact is she did do it out of compassion for Leah, but was it right or wrong? Wrong. So on the surface of things, she was wrong. How could she do this to Yaakov? Why did she agree to make signs if she didn't, if she didn't intend to keep them? You understand this? So why did she make signs to begin with? So that her sister, because they were um, suspicious that the dad was going to do this. Right. But then she like saw how much it meant to her sister. She married first. Mm -hmm. Okay. So again, when she made the signs with Yaakov, the signs are only relevant if the if the dad is trying to deceive him. Yeah. So, it, since they both think that that's possible, and they know that the signs will definitely embarrass Leah. Why make the signs if you don't intend to keep it? You understand the question? Mm -hmm. And what did she think would happen the next day? Okay, so these are, all, these are real questions. Okay, so the idea is as follows. Okay, and bear with me because it's very tricky. Okay, Yaakov had every right to make signs with her, and she had every right to agree to it. Okay, in terms of what? The letter of the law. But there are times when the letter of the law doesn't have to confine you. So when it came, when push came to shove, she was incapable of humiliating her sister to this degree. That was the, that was the issue. So it wasn't part of a plan. If you would have asked her the day before, will you use the signs or not, she would have said yes. It was only when she saw how many people were there, Levin made a point of inviting the entire city to the wedding. She realized Leah could not, could not survive this, okay? Now, I want to tell you the deepest part of this story. Leah didn't know that there were signs. So we don't know anymore what the signs were. The signs are not stated in the Talmud, which is where all of the, um, all of the story is recorded. So there are possibilities, but we don't know what they were. So I'm giving you a theory. Let's say the sign was, if it's really you, you'll wear a carnation, okay? So what did Rachel do? She didn't say... We're a carnation, that way Yaakov will think it's me. No. She said, you need a carnation. And, I, and she pinned it on her. Whatever the sign was, wear a turquoise ring. Whatever the sign was, she got Leah to wear the sign or to say the sign. We don't, it could have been words. Okay? Without Leah even knowing what was happening. So because of that, Leah never felt a debt of gratitude to Rachel. So Rachel made this huge sacrifice out of love of Leah, and Leah never even appreciated it. Was Rachel right or wrong there? Yeah. Right, so it's the flip side of what I told you a moment ago. Remember I said you don't have to become like the person who you hate because you'll become that person? You don't have to expect recognition when you do a good deed, otherwise you're enslaved to other people because you know that they have to give you recognition. You do, you do what's right because that's the person you want to be. So as soon as you sully with that, with repayment or recognition, you're tied down to the other person. So we see later in the chapter, we're going to go back tomorrow, we're going to talk about the birth of the tribes, the meaning of their names, the individuality of different groups of people, how you could figure out who you are. Okay, that's for tomorrow. The tribes are all born. There are 12 tribes. Each one is, was born under a different sign of the zodiac and had a different character trait. This is what composes the Jewish people. After all this happened, okay, the way things played out, as we'll see yesterday, is Rachel had no children. Years and years and years pass. Leah has four children. Okay, Rachel is envious, not of Leah per se, but out of... What did I do? What's limiting me? Because remember we said God responds to who you are? So if my hand is like this, where's the glove? So she said, I'll, I will bring a surrogate woman into the house because maybe I was jealous of Leah, so I'll 
create a situation where I have to overcome jealousy by bringing another woman into the house. So she brings in another woman. Her name is Bilha, okay, who has two children. So now Leah has four. Bilha has two. Okay, this is like serious stuff. Okay, and then Leah brings in a surrogate because she thinks it's, it's the thing to do and they all want it for reasons we'll discuss tomorrow because this is very far from Western thought. To them, having more children was the ultimate means of self-fulfillment and contribution. So Leah gave Yaakov still another wife, whose name was Zilpah, who bears two children. So now, Leah has four of her own. She has two more who she has authority over. That's six children. That's already half of the tribes who are going to be born, and they knew there would be 12. Okay. Um, Rachel's maidservant, who she gave to Yaakov, has two. That means that eight of what? Eight of the 12 are already there, okay? And Leah had another one. That makes it nine, okay? And then Leah has a girl. That makes it 10, okay? So at that point, Rachel finally has a child, okay? But what was the scenario? The scenario was that the eldest of all of the children, whose name was Reuven, came back from the fields one day, and he had a plant that's called Dudaim. Do any, any of you have good Hebrew? So the word Dod, which also means uncle, actually means lover. It means anyone who you're close to. So this was a plant that people at the time believed had fertility properties. So he brought it to his mother, who already had many children, OK? He said, I brought you something, OK? So Rachel sees this, and she asks Leah, could I have that plant? And here she is, she's childless. And Leah, who never knew that Rachel had given her the simanim, OK, said, no. Why did she say no? She was, so she was still jealous of the affection that Yaakov had for Rachel. OK. She said, no. You have my husband's heart. You have to have also have, you know, like, you don't need this. So Rachel said, tonight's my night with Yaakov. Take my night, give me the plants. OK, clear? And she agreed. So Rachel then became pregnant. So you could think that it must have been the fertility plant. But it's not what it says in the text. Do you know what it says? Then God remembered Rachel, opened her womb, and she conceived. So why not before? If it wasn't the plant and its properties, why not before? So I want to tell you two things. One is that if you want something, you have to extend your hand to take it. So her wanting a child enough to plead with Leah for the plant, that in and of itself gave her, gave her a different level of worthiness. You have to like have what? You have to have chutzpah. You, you have to put in efforts. You have to be sincere. So it would be like if you have a friend who tells you, I need a job. I, like, I can't stand this. I have nothing to do all day. The day is so long. I have no water in my day. And you say, have you tried the want ads? And they say, nah, no, one, no one really gets a job from want ads. So they say, well, have you tried an employment agency? And they say, no. They say, have you tried networking with people in your field? And they say, no. Translate, what's really happening? They don't want a job. They want to feel like they want a job, but they don't. So similarly, if you say to God, I want something, but you're making no effort to get it, okay, what he sees is that you don't want. So people think mistakenly that you have to do something physical to demonstrate that you want. It could be prayer. It could be anything. But you have to do something. This is clear? OK, so now we have the completion of all of the tribes almost. So Rachel has a child, OK? Yosef, this is the 11th child, the 11th son, more correctly. Dina isn't one of the tribes. OK, and it's then that. Yaakov realizes it's time to go. He'd been in Levin's house long enough. It's time to go. So what we're going to learn tomorrow is the birth of the tribes, their natures, and what that says about us. Why Yaakov decided now, when 11 of the 12 children were born, that it's time to go. You would think he would have decided either much earlier or waited for all 12 to be born. Why now? 
What you're going to see also is that going turned out to be no simple act. Going means packing. Could you imagine what it is? Four wives, 12 children, okay? No truck. Could you imagine, could you imagine what moving, the horror of moving day? Okay, so we're going to talk about a, an event that took place because Yaakov moved involving him confronting Esau. So that's for tomorrow, okay? And that's it for now.